Welcome back to The Hidden Life of Trees, chapter 9. Um, in the last chapter, I read about what's called tree school and how trees uh, learn and um, how the trees that, um, that have learned how to survive in areas with little water um, can be more, more um, resilient against water shortages than those that have not experienced it very much before and how those that, um, that have been in water abundant areas um, they, it's, it's very difficult for them and they can, it can cause many problems when they're trying to pump the water and there's no water so how they have to change their whole system and pump less water so from that time onwards, there's um, from that time onwards, they actually take less water out of the soil so that they don't have their own problems in the future. It's it's really interesting. Okay, this chapter is called "United We Stand, Divided We Fall." <clears throat> Trees are very social beings. They help each other out, but that is not sufficient for successful survival in the forest ecosystem. Every species of tree tries to procure more space for itself, to optimise its performance, and in this way to crowd out other species. After the fight for light, light, it is the fight for water that finally decides who wins. Tree roots are very good at tapping into damp ground and growing fine hairs to increase their surface area so that they can suck up much, as much water as possible. Under normal circumstances, that's sufficient. But more is always better, and that is why for millions of years, trees have paired up with fungi. Fungi are amazing. They don't really conform to the one-size-fits-all system we use for classifying organisms as either animals or plants. By definition, plants create their own food out of inanimate material, and therefore, they <coughs> can survive completely independently. It's no wonder that green vegetation must sprout on barren, empty ground before animals can move in. But animals can survive only if they eat other living things. Incidentally, neither grass nor young trees like it very much when cattle or deer munch on them. Whether it's a wolf ripping apart a wild boar or a deer eating an oak seedling, in both cases there is pain and death. Fungi are in between animals and plants. Their cell walls are made of, are made of chitin, a substance found in plants, which makes them more like a, a substance never found in plants, which makes them more like insects. In addition, they cannot photosynthesize and depend on organic connections with other living beings they can feed on. Over decades, a fungus's underground cottony web, known as mycelium, expands. There is a honey fungus in Switzerland that covers almost 120 acres and is about a thousand years old. Another in Oregon is estimated to be 2,400 years old, extends for 2,000 acres and weighs 660 tons. That makes fungi the largest known living organisms in the world. I didn't know that, I thought. The two uh, aforementioned giants are not tree friendly. They kill them as they prowl the forest in search of edible, edible tissue. So they take a look. So uh, let's take a look instead at amicable teamwork between fungi and trees. With the help of mycelium, with the help of mycelium of an appropriate species for each tree, for instance, the oak millcap and. The oak millcap and the oak a tree can greatly increase its functional roots surface so that it can suck up considerably more water and nutrients. 
He finds twice the amount of living, life-giving nitrogen and phosphorus in plants that cooperate with fungal partners than in plants that tap the soil with their roots alone. Interesting. To enter into a partnership with one of the many thousands of kinds of fungi, a tree must be very open, literally, because the fungal threads grow into the soft root hairs. There is no research into whether this is painful or not, but as it is something the, tr but as it is something the tree wants, I imagine it gives rise to positive feelings. However, the tree feels from then the tree feels from then on the partners work together however the tree feels from then on the partners work together the fungus not only penetrates and envelops the tree's roots but also allows its web to roam through the surrounding forest floor in so doing it extends the reach of the tree's own roots as the web grows out towards the trees here it connects with other trees fungal partners and roots and so a network is created and now it's easy for the trees to exchange vital nutrients see back in chapter three social security and even information such as an impending insect attack this connection makes fungi something like the forest internet and such a connection has its price as we know these organisms more like animal more like animals in many ways depend on other species for food without a supply of food they would quite simply starve therefore they demand payment in the form of sugar or carbohydrates which their partner tree has to deliver the fungi are not exactly dainty in their requirements they demand up to a third of the tree's total food production in return for their services. A third. Wow. It makes sense in a situation where you are so dependent on another species to leave nothing to chance. And so the delicate fibres begin to manipulate the root tips they envelop. First, the fungi listen in on what the tree has to say through its underground structures. Depending on whether that information is useful to them, the fungi begin to produce plant hormones that direct the tree's cell growth to their advantage. Wow. In exchange for the rich sugary rewards, the fungi provide a few complementary benefits to the tree, such as filtering out heavy metals which are less detrimental to the fungi than to the tree's roots. These d diverted pollutants turn up every fall in their pretty fruiting bodies we bring home in the form of porcini, kepe or bolete mushrooms. Oh, they're bright colours. No wonder radioactive cesia no wonder radioactive cesium, which are found in soil even before the nuclear reactor disaster in Chernobyl in 1986, is mostly found in mushrooms. Medical services are also part of the package. The delicate fungal fibres ward off all intruders, including attacks by bacteria or destructive fellow fungi. Together with their trees, fungi can live to many hundreds of years old, as long as they are healthy. But if conditions in their environment change, for instance, as a result of air pollution, then they breathe their last. Their tree partner, however, does not mourn for long. It wastes no time hooking up with the next species that settles at its feet. Every tree has multiple options fungi and it is only when the last of these passes away that it is really in trouble. Fungi are much more sensitive. Many species seek out the trees that suit them and only they have reserved and once they have reserved them for themselves they are joined to, their, to them for better or worse. Species that like other birches only birches or larches, for instance, 
are called host-specific. Others, such as chant chanterelles, get along with many different trees, <coughs> oaks, birches and spruce. What is important is whether there is still a bit of room underground, and competi competition is fierce. In oak forests alone, more than a hundred different species of fungi may be present in different parts of the roots at, of the same tree. From the oak's point of view, this is a very practical arrangement. If one fungus drops out before environmental conditions change, the next suitor is already at the door. Researchers have discovered that fungi also hedge their bets. Dr. Susanna Simard discovered that their networks are connected not only to specific trees, species, but also to trees of different species. Simard injected into a birch tree radioactive carbon. Simard injected into a birch tree radioactive carbon that moved through the soil into the fungal network of a neighboring uh, Douglas fair. fir. <coughs> Although many species of tree fight each other mercilessly above ground and even try to crowd out each other's root system, the fungi that populate them uh, seem to be intent on compromise. Whether they actually want to support foreign host trees or only fellow fungi in need of help, which these fungi then pass on their trees, is as yet unclear. Um, I suspect fungi are a little more forward thinking than their larger partners. Uh, among trees, each species fights other species. Let's assume the beeches native to Central Europe could emerge victorious in most forests there. Would this really be an advantage? What would happen if a new pathogen came along that infected most of the beaches and killed them? In that case, wouldn't it be more advantageous if there were a certain number of other species around? Oaks, maples, ashes or firs that would continue to grow and provide the shade needed for the new generation of beaches to sprout and grow up. Diversity provides security for ancient forests because fungi are also very dependent on stable conditions. They support other species underground and protect them from complete collapse to ensure that one species of tree doesn't manage to dominate. If things become dire for the fungi and their trees despite all this support and their trees despite all this support then the fungi can take radical action as in the case of the pine and its partner, Lacariobicola, or the bicolor deceiver. When there is a lack of nitrogen, the latter releases a deadly toxin into the soil, which causes minute organisms such as springtail, springtail to die and release the nitrogen tied up in their bodies forcing them to become fertilizer for both the tree and the fungi. I have introduced you to the most important tree helpers. However, there are many more. Consider the woodpeckers. I wouldn't call them a real helpers, but they are at least some of some benefit to the trees. When bark beetles infest spruce, for example, things get dicey. The tiny insects multiply so rapidly they can kill a tree very quickly by consuming its life-given cambium layer. If a great spotted woodpecker gets wind of this, it's on the spot right away, like a oxpecker on a rhinoceros. It climbs up and down the trunk looking for the voracious fat white larvae. It pecks these out, not thinking particularly of the tree, sending chunks of bark flying. Sometimes this can save the spruce from further damage. Even if the tree doesn't come through this procedure alive, its fellow trees are still protected because now there won't be any adult beetles hatching and flying around. The woodpecker 
is not in the slightest bit interested in the well-being of the tree and you can see this particularly clearly in its nesting cavities. It often makes these in healthy trees, severely wounding them as it hacks away. Although the woodpecker frees many trees of pests, for instance oak from wood borer beetles, it is more a side effect of its behaviour than its intent. You know, it's really another interesting chapter. Yeah, it's interesting. I was thinking about how uh, we get nitrogen, how plants get nitrogen from the soil, and um, and uh, how some plants use funguses, fun or um, bacteria that um, live in some biosis with them on their root tips to be able to absorb the nitrogen out of the soil. <sighs> it's really interesting. Okay, take care. Hope you're doing well. All the best. Bye for now.